Hello and good afternoon, everyone. It's um, so nice to be back. It feels like it's been much longer than a week. Um, I'm joined as ever this week by um, Rohan, second week in a row, which is exciting. Um, I don't think I've been with Rohan and his his lovely flesh for over a year now, so it's um, exciting to you know get this close to him. Um, how have you been doing this week, Rohan? Very well, thanks, Matt. Very well. It's uh, there's no trees blocking my path to work, and you know, <laughs> most what, of the country what, has what one, So, all in all, broadly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? I'm all right. Um, no tree, no trees uh, blocking my path down here yet. Um, but I did have a couple of fun days with the trains last week when everything was was blown away. Very nice. Well. We've got, I've just launched a poll and we've seen that about two thirds of our audience today are parents and one third are students. Um, well, oh. um, everyone keep your questions coming in. Obviously Matt and I are going to get through a fair amount of chunk of information today. And um, we're going to whiz through some of the, kind of, because it's such a broad topic, we're going to kind of whiz through the most important points. Um, but if you need specific questions, please do uh, come into the Q&A section. Lovely. Um, so we're we'll talking today about um, degrees that are related to, but not medicine itself. Um, I've taken this a little bit from the perspective of someone who has um, had four pieces of bad news over the last couple of months. Um, but of course, a lot of what we're going to talk about will apply just as much to students who are uh, uh, have been applying to apply for for dentistry, for physiotherapy, for biochemistry from the very beginning. Um, but if you feel that this is a little bit too too focused on a disappointed medic, then then we're sorry there. Um, um, so we'll be thinking, yeah, first about um, where uh, where we are kind of in the UCAS process um, and looking ahead to next year. Um, thinking about what the options um, allied to medicine are, other than medicine itself, and of course we'll be talking about the kind of support that um, we at Union Admissions offer, um, as well as that. Um, now, as we've talked about in um, in recent weeks. I think two, three or four weeks ago when we were first talking about medicine. Um, medicine has never been more popular, and that goes for uh, medicine itself, for biochemistry, for medical science, physiotherapy, nursing. All of these subjects have been hugely popular over the last several, um, the last several years, and a particular bump in the last um, two years. Can't imagine why. I guess something must have happened. Um, and so that is um, a really important part of, of understanding the context here, which is that these subjects have never been as competitive um, as they are now. Um, mm. Playing into that, we have the uh, in the situation with A-levels. Um, if you are a parent or indeed a student, you'll probably be aware of the interesting things that have happened with A-level grades over the past, um, the past several months, um, several years. Um, and Rohan, you, you've spoken to a lot of students about this, right? Yeah, I mean, whenever I do consultations with parents, I mean, two, three years ago, actually, straight A-stars, straight eights or nines weren't, you know, they, they, they were definitely common, but I wouldn't say they were the norm or the average. Whereas now, very much, it's the, it, it essentially seems like it's, if you don't have straight eights and straight eights and nines or straight A-stars, you're actually in the minority. Um, to the extent where I think you know, we almost, I mean, we do ask them in our, in our kind of consultation process, but if we don't think that that's important, can you imagine how many applicants are applying with perfect grades to university? It's going to be a very difficult time for university to select, let alone us. Yeah, and there's, um, there's no strong reason to believe that these numbers are going to come back down again, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, this is something both Rohan and I have been spending some time looking at over the past few weeks, um, as the government has um, uh, completed a, a review over the way these qualifications are going to work in the future. Um, they've, fight, they've given up for the, I think, fourth time in my memory at um, changing when the UCAS deadline is, which is always al always fun. One of those things that comes up every every three or four years. Um, it's a bit like a, it's a bit like three D cinema. I think like it's always like a quirky, fun idea, but then. <laughs> No one actually wants it by the time you know, it sounds like great, but then no one actually wants it by the time it gets rolled out. <laughs> uh, and the, the government has again uh, refused to discuss whether or not there'll be an A double star coming, which um, 
it was was my prediction. I think eighteen months ago, it is beginning to look more and more likely. Um, and we see the same sort of pattern with GCSEs as well. Um, the share of students who are getting uh, sevens uh, or above, so that's seven, eight, and nine, um, has uh, very nearly doubled over the past twenty years. And we see that an enormous amount of that change happened in the last two. Um, and that again is the impact of of the pandemic and the and the choices that were made around that. Um, now, of course, for you as an individual student, this kind of grade inflation is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. It is good to get good grades. The, the difficulty is really for the universities. Um, because if you're trying to compare, let's say, 10 students who want to apply for a particular course, but all of them have more or less the same GCSEs and more or less the same predicted A-levels, making a comparison between them becomes much more difficult. Um, previously, when only... Um, 15, 16 percent of GCSE entries were getting an A. You know, the chances of a student getting um, a full set of A's were pretty small. This is a little complicated from a probability perspective because the A's are extremely highly correlated. I think it's an R somewhere up in the uh, 0.8 range. Um, but now you're looking at a situation where there will be schools where there are just not very, very many B's in the school at all. Um, and that makes the challenge of um, Comparing students for the university is really difficult because they will have students who have very similar looking records. Um, and so it can be very difficult to make choices between them. The way we tend to think of this in terms of application, university applications um, is through a pie chart. Um, this is something that we've altered in the, uh, for this cycle, um, lowering the weight of GCSEs and pushing up the weight of admissions test scores. And this goes um, particularly for medicine and medicine related subjects, um, particularly things like dentistry, where you're still sitting admissions test. Right, Rohan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the GCSEs just are less important as well. I mean, they're still important in the sense they're a decent screening tool, but that's all they are now. Um, I mean, my old, my old college at Cambridge, what they used to do, Matt, before the A stars came in, was that they used to take your percentage of your actual raw UMS in your chemistry A level then plot that against essentially the your BMAT score now it kind of give you a better indications so obviously it wasn't just just because you got 90% you're in it was what how much more than 90% did you get and I think you know universities are going to carry on doing that once GCSEs become once we start sitting paper exams again so yeah like ultimately GCSEs will count for less we think that that should normalize assuming the GCSC proportions normalize to what they used to be um, I think Matt and I are pretty convinced that we're, they're going to bring in a 10 uh, on, on that zero to nine scale to kind of politically be very risky, right? To, to essentially have the number of percentage of people getting nines drop by half, which is what it'd have to be. Absolutely. Um, I think a 10 is, is very likely. And when, we look, and when we look at the way the GCSE grading system is, is built, I think this was, this was planned from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you number something one to nine without um, without bearing in mind the the uh, possibility of a ten, um, maybe even eleven for for spinal tap fans. Yeah. Um, but the, how they'll do this with the A levels is going to be a little bit trickier because, of course, one good A star. I don't know what you call it then. A double star, a planet, <laughs> a supernova, um, a galaxy. <laughs> Yeah, I please please uh, send in any suggestions you've got, but um, I think that the 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 adjustments they'll be a little tricky, but certainly mm. in GCSE, I wouldn't be shocked in twenty twenty five if we have a, a ten available. Yeah, and I think look, I mean we joke about this, but and you know obviously it's not nice being in a position where you are applying and competing with potentially ten to twenty other very bright able students, but the universities have a very different job to do, which is. And a very difficult job, which is they have to essentially distinguish between these very academically able students, which look identical on paper. And the only way they realistically can do that is to make candidates jump through some extra hoops like the tests and like the interviews. So treat them as a challenge and a way to kind of excel and differentiate yourself rather than kind of a chore. Yeah. Um... So this sort of leads into the sort of the contextual piece. Um, I imagine that a, a good number of you here today will be students who have applied for medicine this year and not been successful and are figuring out where to go next or are worried that that will be, you'll be in your situation next year. Um, and so I've kind of taken that, that viewpoint a little bit here. Um, so if you have applied for medicine, 
you know, bear in mind that it has never been more competitive. Um, mm -hmm. The vast majority of students who apply for medicine do not get it in. Um, it's something of the 12%. It may even be close to percent this year. Um, as well, students they, who are successful. Yeah, I think, I mean, I read somewhere in the news recently that normally there's about 10,000 spaces. There's only going to be about 8,000 this year. Um, so, you know, it's just because there were just so many deferrals from, from previous years. Um, so it's the hardest. There's been more applicants and less spaces. So, yes, my heart does go out to everyone who didn't quite make the cut. Yeah. And that, and particularly in the context of what we've been talking about, about GCSEs, about A-levels, that may have nothing to do with your actual merit as a as a student. Um, if you imagine the kind of distribution there where only the top 10% get in, but then you also remember that there's quite a lot of fuzziness at work, it's entirely possible that you were in the top 5, 6, 7%, but the, the quality of the information available, just a little bit of random chance, made it look as though you were actually only in the 13th, 14th percent you know there's a there's a lot of uncertainty at work here um which is one of the reasons that we are and this is something we're going to talk about in a moment so positive about the idea of reapplying for medicine um it is a, a completely reasonable thing to do and so that's something to think about as well as um applying for subjects related to medicine as well so we'll be talking about different entry points um different directions things things like that um so I said, as I said before, if you are in this position of being, um, of figuring out what alternatives to medical school there are for you in September, uh, we'll be looking at four. Um, we'll be looking at reapplying. We'll be looking at graduate entry. Uh, we'll be looking at alternative paths in um, in kind of the medical set, in medical settings, and we're also going to be talking about other parts of the world. Ooh, foreign, exciting foreign stuff. Um, so the the first option is reapplying. Um, this is pretty standard, right? I imagine that um, a huge chunk of people uh, you were at medical school with Rohan and that you knew were had applied more than once. Yeah, and I think it, it's actually massive. I think one in six applications to UCAS are from reapplicants, or one in six Oxbridge and medical applicants are from reapplicants. So it's a it's a huge chunk of people, um, and. As you've said, Matt, um, people have a better chance of getting in the second time around because you're essentially applying with confirmed grades. So it's less of a risk to the university as well. Yeah, and that's and that's completely borne out by the research we've done. Um, Reapplicants to Cambridge get in um, forty percent more. They're forty percent more likely to get in. Um, and remember, with med school, this is kind of cumulative because you're now looking at eight opportunities to get in rather than four. So. Um, you know, you're, you're really enhancing your odds at that point. Um, you've got a lot of things going through in that situation. You're going to have an, a year's more maturity, which in med school is really important. Um, most people don't want to be treated by a very, very, very young doctor. And having the maturity and the personality and the experience to be a good doctor is, you know, really important and is a lot of what's being tested for in interviews. So having that extra year to, to prepare yourself is going to be really valuable. Um, it's a lot of extra time to revise an admissions test. You know, if you didn't do as well as you'd have liked on the BMAT, you've got a whole year to, to get the hang of it, which um, we'll talk about in a, in a few slides time. But the, the margins in the BMAT are very important and can be, can be quite fine in terms of um, whether you get in or not. So that's reapplying. Um, you also have the graduate entry route. Um, now, of course, in huge swaths of the world, it's um, not the done thing to, become, to start medical school at 18. States, you have to wait until you're at least 23, I think. Or thereabouts um, and so most doctors in the states won't be actually in practice until their um until their late 20s so if you were to go into an american hospital you would not find a, a 24 year old in the way that you would in in the uk um and there are and there are benefits to that in the way that that's that's done in the uk um so there are plenty of um, most universities will offer graduate entry it's something that started about 25 years ago Mm -hmm. uh, the first place to do it was St. George's University, but it's become uh, much more commonplace. Um, roughly 10% of all medical students are doing it after doing another degree. Um, and those degrees really vary. Um, there are, of course, people who do the kind of classic stuff. They do medical science, they do biochemistry, they do biology. Um, and then they, and they do that in the knowledge that this is about going for graduate entry medicine at the end of it. Um, mm -hmm. We also get other, other things. When I was at King's, there was a guy who did uh, music who then went on to become a doctor. I think he went to Bart's. Um, 
And that's, a, that's a pretty <laughs> impressive career change. I, I think, Matt, like <laughs> the key thing I would like to stress here is um, graduate entry is often seen as like something people can just do as a backup. Like, oh, well, I didn't get into undergrad medicine. I'll just do biomedicine or pharmacy or and then apply as a graduate medic. The stats for graduate entry medicine are extremely scary uh, compared to undergraduate medicine. So whilst undergraduate medicine is competitive, depending on the medical school you applied to, it can be you know, five, five to 20% success rate. Graduate medicine can be as low as two or 3%. And in fact, I think pretty much every medical school has 40, 40 plus places for, sorry, 40 plus applicants for every place. So it is fierce. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you are considering graduate entry medicine in the UK and, you, and you're considering it because you've not got the place you wanted undergrad, I would strongly suggest that you consider your options strongly and essentially consider an undergraduate reapplication rather than graduate, if the goal is ultimately to be a doctor. So, um, yeah, I was just I was just glancing at our data, Rohan, and we uh, our data sets show a success rate of just under ten percent at Cambridge for graduate entry medicine, and Oxford don't even offer it. Yeah. Uh, and, so, and Cambridge is actually, you know, Cambridge is really intense, but it's not even the most competitive, ironically. I think the, the places like Warwick, for instance, where it's closer to 3%, so it is fierce out there. So, yeah, just keep that in mind. I mean, obviously go for it because there's not, I think people do get in, but it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, and we we make an effort as we possibly can in these webinars to be, to be honest with students. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these are competitive courses. These are difficult things to get into. It isn't the end of the world. Uh, I myself have never become a doctor. And at 32, I think it's unlikely I'm going to now. Um, there are other perfectly good um, areas you can move into um, and still be in a kind of medical adjacent area. Um, you know, believe it or not, not everyone who works in a hospital is a doctor. Someone has to organise the doctors because, well, Rohan might be the exception here, but I've met plenty of doctors who are unbelievably disorganized and in urgent need of being organized by someone else <laughs> um but thinking about alternative yeah areas, what's your um, skills <laughs> <laughs> thinking about an alternative of, of paths into kind of medicine related areas though um you know think about why it is you want to be involved in in medicine broadly you know are you interested in the uh the work caring for other people are you interested in the um uh, the, the, the real sort of scientific detail of it. Are you interested in um, the, ki the kind of real in-depth science part of it? Are you interested in it for um, reasons that are particularly related to the body? Are you interested in it because you want to be doing something that's really, really intellectually stimulating? Are you interested in the, um, the pharmaceutical side of it? You know, what, what part of it is that it that appeals to you? And do you want to look at one of those other options? Um, Unlike being a doctor, I know quite a few people who are uh, pharmacists, and I'm told that the um, work-life balance for a pharmacist is excellent, unlike being a doctor. Um, they actually work like normal nine, ten hour days, and they get weekends off if you work as a pharmacist. And the money is still pretty good, um, so it's got that going for it. Um, if, you are, if you are really interested in the um, in the patient side of it, then you should look at um, whether you want to go into nursing as well. You know, many hospitals now, the role of nurses has really ramped up in terms of seriousness. And there are non-degree routes into nursing as well through um, uh, nurse, pra uh, nurse degree practitioner apprenticeships. There are lots of different ways into nursing. And the nice thing about doing one of those degree apprenticeships is it's a hell of a lot cheaper um, than going to university. Um, at the opposite end of cheap, you've got dentistry. If you want to do something really expensive, um, consider dentistry. Um, I made this joke, I think, the week before last, but there's a lot of money in dentistry, and most of it's mine at this point because I went to the dentist and it was very expensive. Um, <laughs> so that's a, that's a, that's another thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, and in no fairness and seriousness, dentists do have a much better work-life balance than, than medics do, and you know the, the, the pay potential, the the ability to be self-employed and actually control where you work, the ability to get into private practice much easier. There's a lot going for dentistry. Uh, you know, so if you are interested in that like type of work, 
then definitely consider it. Consider it. Um, and as Matt's mentioned, there are other options available in nursing physiotherapy. They've gone are the days when essentially doctors would do the diagnosing and nurses would just kind of carry out their order. Like that's like an archaic remnant from the 80s now, though, but it's very different in real life. Um, you know, nurses often prescribe, nurses do a huge amount of diagnostician work. You can, as Matt said, get advanced nurse practitioners who are basically running the entire clinics and offering specialist services like McMillan nurses or cancer nurses um, who are essentially, you know, not just running entire clinics, but also diagnosing and taking care of the patient from start to finish. So the overlaps between medical care and nursing care are getting greater rather than smaller. Yeah, certainly to, from the viewpoint of someone from the 60s or 70s, I think they would at this point find it difficult to tell which ones were nurses and which ones were doctors. Yeah. Um, um, and then we thought we mentioned briefly, you know, medical research. If you're into this because you are really interested in uh, drug development, if you're really interested in vaccines, you know, there is nothing wrong with skipping the bit where you become a doctor and you can go straight into being a research chemist. Um, if that's what the priority that you're really interested in, it may not make sense you to spend two years doing physiology and learning the names of all the bones, when if all you're really interested in is blood chemistry, um, you know, go straight into that, go and do biochemistry, go and straight chemistry, you know, figure out the thing that you actually want to do and consider going straight in there because a lot of those courses are going to still be available um, and are going to be a better fit for you because I think one of the, my understanding with Rohan, one of the challenges of medicine is there's a lot of stuff in there um, and if you're planning to specialise quite quickly afterwards, some of it might not be stuff that you wanted to do in the first place or are going to end up using. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, finally, maybe you wanted to study something else. Um, you wouldn't be the first person who was like, I want to either be a doctor or a history teacher. Um, the overlap between interest in medicine and me uh, medicine and teaching is pretty large. There are a lot of people who are interested in medicine for um, reasons other than the science. And so if you um, are changing your mind, then I do look at that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with going and getting a history degree and then walking over to the NHS the week you graduate and go, right, I want to run a hospital. Um, you don't need to be a doctor to run a hospital. If anything, it helps not to be because <laughs> you want to be, you know, skilled in the in the administration, the people management, all of the macro skills that don't overlap all that much with medicine, but are going to allow you to have an enormous impact on the success of those do doctors by, um, you know, allowing them to do their best work. I'm sure you. I'm sure you've met plenty of good hospital managers and bad hospital managers, Rahan. Uh, yeah, I was, gonna say, I was thinking about this. I don't think I've met any hospital managers um, when when I was a doctor. Which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I suppose it <laughs> means the hospital's running without them. But, uh, but you know, Matt's point still stands. There, we always need talented, um, keen, hungry individuals who are able to drive change or the positive in the NHS or in the private setting as well. Yeah. Um, now, you alluded a little bit towards the, uh, the BMAT earlier on. Um, I was going to talk briefly about this, particularly in the context of dentistry, which I believe that you need the BMAT for most dental schools these days. Um, the difference in terms of your performance there makes a huge difference to your chance of getting in. Um, you can see here, this is from the last normal year of the BMAT we have, which is the uh, students who sat it in November of 2019 and we see that the difference between the the average BMAT score uh, which is a 4.5 which is looking at that graph roughly I would say 17 out of 32 something like that the difference between that and students who are getting an extra couple of marks and then an extra couple of marks on top of that that's how fine the margins are in terms of these um, uh, these medical applications and so again if you haven't been successful this year Bear in mind, it may just have been a kind of two mark. It may have been a little bit of luck. It may have been that you struggled for time. There's, it's entirely possible that there's nothing that you could have done and that going for it again is going to work or picking an alternative path. Um, but just to feel reassured that, you know, the difference between one mark and the next is a 20% chance. So we're only talking about what 20% of 20%. It's a 5% chance of getting... Um, you know, moved one one or the either way, and that's a that that's an easy margin for when you think there are thirty two questions, right, Rahan? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all we're trying to do is to make sure that you, instead of improving from 
zero to 20. All we're trying to do is marginal improvements from 20 to 25 will, you know, essentially put you from the middle pack all the way into the top quartile, if not the top two deciles. Yeah, as you can you can see from the percentage of candidates along the y-axis, um, each correct answer is bumping you ahead of um, percent of people, which, you know, in the BMAT, I think is something like 500 people, um, or perhaps even more. So that, that extra correct answer makes a big difference. And so if things haven't worked out or if you're planning ahead, you know, bear in mind that these are fine margins that they're margins you can manipulate and that you can improve. But there are also margins that you shouldn't be, be beating yourself up about if it comes down to, to something that fine. Um, so after all of that, you're probably hoping to escape from the BMAT, um, which means we can escape from the UK early to think about other parts of the world. Um, because, and I, I only found out about this recently, they have universities everywhere now. Um, it's not just Oxford, Paris and Cambridge. Things have really moved on since the 14th century. Um, they're all over the place. Um, and many of these universities will have um, different entry requirements. I know that the University of Nicosia on Cyprus uh, will look at students who are ABB at their A-levels. Um, and certain situations there, you're going to be looking at lower fees and the lower cost of living. It's certainly cheaper to live on Cyprus than it is in London. Um, and you're probably going to get a better standard of living in Cyprus as well, because the weather is much better. Um, in terms of fees, you can also look at places, um, the Italian universities are Rohan's particular specialism, but there are, I believe now, 13 different Italian universities offering medical training in English, um, and the fees are much lower, and, well, I mean, I, perhaps I'm being mean picking on Lancaster here, I think I picked it because it doesn't have a medical school, um, but I think I would rather live in Milan, given the choice. What, what about you, Rohan? Yeah, this is it, right? Like, why would you pay nine grand for five years when to, to live in a mythical place in Lancaster Medical School but versus Milan or Rome uh, where you can have again all the teachings done in English um, GMC certified and you pay 500 pounds for, for your tuition fees instead of nine grand so just those are just options that you know people should consider because I think it's one of these best kept secrets that just very few people know about yeah and as, as we emphasize a lot when we're talking about um, medicine more broadly, you are, you are a real doctor regardless of where you've been. And I think if I had the opportunity to spend five years becoming a doctor while learning Italian, eating beautiful food, enjoying the sunshine, that does sound better than most of the, the degree options in the UK. Um, many of these universities don't interview as well. Um, so it does come down to the IMAT, uh, which is um, surprisingly unlike the BMAT. Um, but there are parallels and it's something that we have resources and support for as well. Um, so we're, we're more than happy to help with that if that's something you're interested in um, as an alternative to the UK. Um, so I feel like I've talked a little bit more than I intended about um, students who haven't had the, the outcome they were hoping for with the UK um, application process for medicine. I hope that hasn't um, upset anyone. Oh, and Cara writes to tell us that Lancaster does have a medical school. God. That's a medical school. It looks like it's a new one as well. I'm just looking it up now. Oh no! Oh. Right, uh, do we have a rewind button? Can I go back and bleep <laughs> that out? Oh no, it's in the slides. Oh no. Oh, thank you, Cara. See, you should, you should come and help with the proofreading. Um, so, um, we've uh, had a, <laughs> a brief moment there of how we can be helped um, from Cara, who could definitely help. Um, but um, how can we help? So I'm thinking about the support that uni admissions offer. I'm gonna gonna hand over to Rohan now for a, for a few slides to talk about the, the support we offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I, th I think you know just just on that note, there are more medical schools now than there've ever been, uh, which is great because you know, the British government is realizing that actually we need more doctors. Uh, I think everyone knows my kind of dream is to have a have my own medical school one day where we can teach people to be doctors in three years instead of five years but that's a probably a separate conversation for a separate webinar um the way that we work is we like to work with students for ideally at least 12 months uh, and we work with them intensively for this period because that's how we deliver results so it's the same as if you were going to try and get your child into a private school 
you wouldn't just go uh, and ask them and expect them to deliver results and get them into Oxbridge or medical school or any other course for that matter in a few weekends or in a few days. What you do is you send their child there consistently day after day, and that's kind of what we try and do. So we brand ourselves essentially as, a, as an Oxbridge medical school and that essentially is a prep school. And the way we work is we expect our students to do about 200 to 300 hours of work across the space of a year. Um, yes, it is a lot of work. And yes, it does take time. Um, but the results speak for themselves. So the way our support works and the way we work with students is broadly categorized into these four uh, pillars of our support. So the first of these is uh, individual teaching. So if, let's say someone's applying for medicine. We'll pair them with someone who's a medical tutor and they'll typically have studied at the same university that they're applying to. And normally they'll have anywhere between 30 to 50 hours of one-to-one -one teaching. Again, it depends on the student circumstances. This is why it's essential that we speak not just to the parents, but also to the students to make sure that they're going to be a good fit for us as much as we're going to be a good fit for you. Normally, we'll only work with about 30 to 35 percent of students that actually end up, uh, we end up speaking to. Uh, so, you know, we are selective and we have to be to keep our success rates up. The, the second part is um, essentially our resources. So we've got about 100 books uh, that we've published. And what we do is we give you access to all of them, plus all of your additional resources, which are essentially exclusive to our program clients. Um, so that's uh, questions, uh, admissions tests, videos, resources, work solutions, and our prep portal, which is the, the kind of tech platform, which kind of feeds and ties all these things together is the bit that's used to deliver all of our teaching. The, the next bit is the enrichment seminars. So these are that take place every Sunday uh, at two o'clock. We've actually, um, they started earlier in January and the next one's actually tomorrow. And the idea of these is to really stretch students beyond what they're learning uh, at, in, in essentially in school. So the idea is if you get to interview and your admissions tutor, ask them like, what are you interested in? That you can really go above and beyond and really show that level of depth um, that other students and other peers aren't going to be able to do so. And they're, they're designed to be interactive, so you can actually get a sense of what the competition is doing. And then fourth and finally, is we've got our intensive courses. So again, let's say you're applying for medicine, you'll typically have a couple of UCAT courses, a couple of BMAT courses, there'll be a personal statement course, interview course, and those are essentially verticals. So they take place on weekends throughout the year. And the idea of these is just really to top you up completely. Um, so all in all, what we do is we essentially allow you to, you know, we have a curriculum. The curriculum works if the student puts, puts the work into it, um, but it is a huge amount of work uh, to do. But if you follow, do, follow through and do what we tell you to, then we see some pretty spectacular results. Um, if you're interested in working with us, it is, we do have a selection process. You do have to speak to one of our consulting team. That might be me, or that might be one of our other uh, consultants. The important thing is we'll give you some open, honest, transparent advice about your chances. And then it's a way for you to make your make the decision on your own. Fab. Um, well, um, <laughs> thanks, Rohan. Um, uh, Rohan's really talked um, really nicely through sort of the, the support we offer. Um, the good news is it does seem to work. Um, we were successful with around 72% of our, our medicine applications over the last few years. Um, that's something we're really proud of. And I am um, confident that expertise extends to, to medicine related degrees as well. Um, our numbers compare really favorably with even the top schools in the country. Um, and we don't wear any silly hats. So we've got that going for us. Uh, take that, Ethan. Um, and... Um, I just wanted to emphasize if you are, um, yeah, considering uh, coming to work with us and um, are a little worried about cost, we do have um, support through the Uni Admissions Foundation. Um, we aim to work with just as many students this year on a reduced fee basis as we do on a full fee basis. So if that's something that's a concern for you, please let us know. And it's something we'll be able to um, take into account throughout the, throughout the process. Um, I guess we'll uh, move on to some questions now, if that's all right uh, with everyone. Uh, I can't hear any objections. That's the beauty of the webinar format. Um, <laughs> so please do drop those into the Q&A section and we'll um, start working through those now. Um, 
fabulous. We've got a great, um, uh, uh, we've got one great question already. Um, what kinds of science degrees uh, tend to be available in clearing? And what quality of universities are available in clearing? Now, this is something that's changed a lot since I was um, a plot university, I seem to think, Rohan. It's a little while since I looked, but I think almost everyone entered clearing last year, right? It did. Uh, a medicine didn't, unsurprisingly, of course. Um, we, you normally see pretty much every Russell Group university participating in clearing, um, even for science subjects. It's a mad dash on the day. So there are spaces available. Even a few years ago, there were, you know, I think, 100 or plus places available for medicine. I mean, that's just unheard of now. Um, but th th that's the, the kind of way that typically things will work is there will be a few hundred places dotted out per course. And to a certain extent, it is first come, first serve. Um, um, there's no particular way or algorithm to kind of predict this. <coughs> Right, just having a sneezing fit. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully that helps. Yeah. Um, we, there's also the uh, the adjustment process, which is new um, in the last few years, which does allow you to um, apply again if you have uh, performed better than your um, expected grade. So if you were expecting a bunch of Bs and you've ended up with a bunch of As, um, then you can go and have a look at one of the universities that are kind of above what you have been aiming for. Um, so it does go both ways. It's not just um, your expectations coming down. It can be your expectations coming up, um, which is nice. Um, and from the same person, a question about um, science degrees and a shorter medicine degree. Now, I believe a lot of um, graduate places, they'll let you do it in four rather than five, right, Rohan, if you've got the, the medical background? Uh, yeah, it depends on which degree you're applying to. If you're applying for undergraduate, you'll still have to unfortunately do the full five, five to six year course. If you've got a three year science degree um, and you're applying for a medical graduate degree, then yes, you'll essentially do the medical graduate course, which is different. Yeah, just flicking through the layer. Um, um, it's the case. extremely likely that you'll be able to. Yeah, and that's the case at Southampton, at Barts, at Newcastle, St George's, um, a bunch of places. So that's very much an option if you've you've already done if you've already done all the chemistry and more, then you do get to have a slightly accelerated process. Um, I hope the recording is not cutting up too much. I'm not having much luck with the Wi-Fi here today. If uh, if anything's cutting out for anyone from me. Um, um after helping us out with our, our knowledge of uh northwest england uh car is back um um some interesting stuff going on in wales apparently with students who apply for medicine being offered um medical science degrees um rather than being um rejected for medicine entirely which is a, an interesting move um and uh jad writes asking us about the process for medical graduates from outside the uk coming to work over here um I, I i imagine you've worked with lots of um uh non-uk trained doctors and nurses over the years right rohan yeah the process is a bit it really depends on where exactly you're coming from and essentially the rules do change on this fairly regularly typically if you've got a medical degree um from a medical school that the gmc in the uk um, medical schools council recognized <laughs> So they'll typically be medical schools in places like Australia, for instance, or a couple of European countries. Then you can kind of bypass a lot of that process. Um, if you haven't, then you'll have to go through essentially an accreditation process, which will often involve exams. Uh, typically, this used to be called the PLAB, PLAB. Um, and then, of course, most when you apply for jobs, you'll often have to apply for things like staff grades or fellowships before you can actually enter any training uh, program. So it is a lot more involved, but it just depends on which medical schools you've gone to. Lovely stuff. Thanks, Ro. Um, oh, and oh, this is a useful question here, Rohan, coming through in the chat. Um, if you apply to, can you use your fifth choice to apply to a different course at the same university when you're, when you're applying for medicine? So say you want to go to, um, you're really keen on Birmingham and apply for Birmingham Medicine, but also Birmingham Biochemistry. Is that is that allowed? Yeah, I think it is allowed. 
I would actually suggest that often what will happen um, is often, you know, ultimately universities want to fill their places and they want the best students there. When they reject students, it's not unheard of them to, let's say you apply for Birmingham Medicine, it's not unheard of for Birmingham in particular to offer um, a place in their biomedics course, for instance. So that's just a standard kind of almost to step down, if you want to look at it that way, in the sense that Birmingham will just say, well, you weren't quite good enough for this degree, but we think this one will be more suited for you. If you're really particularly keen on a specific course, like I don't know, if you really want to do uh, biomedical engineering at UCL or Imperial, then yes, do. then you can, can apply for it. But just keep in mind that if you do get rejected from universities, it's fairly frequent for them to make an offer for a related degree um, in that specific institution itself. So you may not want to waste your fifth, fifth choice at the same university. Lovely. Um, I think that kind of covers it. Are there any other um, questions you feel we should uh, look at, Rohan, or are you happy for today? No, I think that we've covered a fair bit of ground. Um, what I would suggest is just kind of booking in a consultation because some people's situations, you know, the questions we're getting do imply that they are very specific and nuanced. And it's very difficult often to answer one of these questions. I have to ask another 10 questions to kind of get a better understanding of it. So if you are interested in working with us, we just want some more information, please do book a consultation. Uh, and the, the GIF that's running right now is going to be explaining how to do that. Lovely stuff. As Rohan says, um, if, uh, it's always much better to speak to us than to try and get a, a straight answer through these webinars. Not because we don't want to, but because it often requires looking things up, getting asking more questions, really getting a rounded sense of you. And it's much better to do them um, one on one than one on one on forty or fifty, um, as the case may be. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we'll see you next week when we're going to be talking. Oh, it's my favourite topic next week. So please do all come. We're going to be doing graphs, um, and I'm going to be getting into some of the. Um, the really fine points of the data around um, applications, admissions, tests, um, what subjects have what impact on your chances, and really getting into the uh, really getting into the details. So that one will probably be very long, uh, very boring, very self indulgent. Uh, but please do join us next time for that, and um, have a lovely weekend, everyone. Cheers, Matt. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.